much. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so welcome to the MLA and MA Landscape Architecture Open Day. So just to introduce who's here, uh, my name is Emma Coltest. I'm the admissions tutor for the landscape architecture programs. And I also teach one of the design studios, uh, Design Studio One. So if you place an application with us this year, you'll be coming into contact with me, hopefully throughout this process up until the point you could possibly uh, enroll. I'm also joined here today by Tom and two of our lovely students. So I'm just gonna pass it over to Tom to introduce himself first. Hi, yeah, my name's Tom. I um, a design tutor on the course and also work in kind of cooperation with the coordination on the course and I coordinate the skills modules as well and I'll be talking a little bit today about the design program and also the skills modules too. Great thank you Tom. So I'll just pass over to Aditi if you can unmute. Hi everyone uh, I'm Aditi Nair and I am a year two student. Um, I'm uh, from Studio 5 and later on during the presentation I'll be talking through how Studio 5 works and uh, skimmed through a couple of projects. Thank you. Great, thank you. And then I'll pass over to Zoya. Hi everyone, I'm Zoya. Um, I'm also in MLA2. I was in Studio 8 last year and I'm also continuing to be in Studio 8 this year. Um, excited to chat with you guys and like I did here we'll be going through some of the projects of Studio 8 and just like um, studio culture in general. Great thanks guys thanks so much for joining me today. So what we're planning to do is we're going to introduce both the programs and um, we'll talk about the program structure first. So there we go. So this consists of the design studios, the history and theory modules, ecology and technology and practice and skills. And then we're going to go through some of the program resources um, and kind of Bartlett studio culture. And finally, we'll wrap up talking about the admissions process and sharing some fantastic student work. And then finally, we will have a live Q&A portion to answer your questions. So please do use the chat function in Zoom as well as we're going through. So hopefully uh, you know that the Bartlett is part of University College London. We're a, a kind of top ranking renowned university. We have a number of different faculties and departments and we are a world renowned architecture school which encompasses a lot of different subjects and we're very research driven here. And the Bartlett has a long standing history of being quite speculative and experimental and hopefully this comes through uh, in the student work as well. So in terms of um, the programme, we're committed to a landscape-based education, which aligns with the school's kind of ethical ambitions. And this is to support sustainability and deal with real world challenges such as uh, biodiversity loss, uh, climate change and ecological crisis. So just to give you a bit more information about the kind of founders and the co-directors of the program. So this is uh, Professor Laura Allen and Professor Mark Smelt. They run a design research practice called Smelt Allen and here you can see some of their works and their research and published books as well. So they've been uh, pioneering really landscape based research for many, many years at the Bartlett, um, over 20 years before uh, founding this program. So their work focuses on these dynamic relationships uh, between natural and man-made landscapes, and this can be revealed through design projects and design research. So just to talk briefly about the different kind of streams and how the different modules overlap on our program. Um, so as you can see uh, from this extract, this is uh, the MLA1 um, or the program structure, structure for year one. Uh, so you, in this case, a year one student will be covering three different streams, which are history and theory, landscape environment and technology, and then landscape design. And as you can kind of see, they overlap at different points in the year. And you'll also have skills and practice modules that we'll come back to. So then uh, in second year of the MLA2, again, you'll be covering these three different aspects. And you'll have a more ambitious kind of design project, which goes on for a bit longer alongside a landscape thesis. So again, you can see how these overlap and they begin and stop throughout the year. So moving into design. So this really is the core component of the course, and this makes up the bulk of your time here on the program and um, the assessed modules. Oh, there we go. So uh, the design is structured through these different studios. So we have this year from studios one to studio eight and the studios uh, come up with a different brief every year. 
and they're taught by all different people, uh, including myself and Tom. And you can see some of the names, so feel, please uh, feel free to look them up. And we have a mixture really of landscape architects, designers, researchers, um, academics, and even illustrators as well. So with this really um, great mix of people, it helps to test different methodologies and see different types of work within each studio. So you can see some of these different briefs we've been exploring so far this year. And these get refreshed and updated every year to respond to different landscape phenomena or, or different environmental issues that um, students may wish to as well to address through the design work. And each studio has its own kind of methods. So uh, the tutors are kind of experts in different things and we recommend to students they should really pick a studio that appeals to them um, through the ways that they work and the brief and the things they want to tackle that year. So you'll see there's various different approaches um, and you can see this as well in our different methods. So for example, there's digital surveying, some studios particularly focus on materiality or on-site sampling and testing. And with us as well, across the board, there's um, kind of various approaches to drawing, prototyping and digital surveying. And so with this, students um, definitely define these approaches as well and really bring their interests uh, to the table. So just to note as well, students are never told um, exactly what to do uh, in that they uh, kind of interpret the brief themselves and they develop their own way of working, um, which is supported and enhanced by the design tutors. So this just gives you an idea of some of the design projects we tackle. Um, so this includes things like ecosystems, landscape representation, life cycles, it goes on and on. And we also would hope that you guys would bring your own initiatives and passions uh, to the course. Um, for example, maybe this is linked as well to the history and theory or linked to environmental work. This can be um, very kind of specific to people's passions. So just to go through as well, uh, the structure of the course in a bit more detail. So if this is still for design and in term one, the MLA one uh, starts off with more of an introductory uh, project. Again, you might've come from a different um, background than landscape architecture or design. And uh, this first kind of two modules as well, introduced um, site research and the design process. Uh, and then for year two, this is advanced landscape design two, which again is kind of research making, drawing and mapping. And this develops from kind of their process in MLA one as they kind of focus and test different methods such as um, perhaps focusing more on photography or model making through the skills they've developed in the previous year as well. Then in terms two and three, this um, uh, often we, well, I think in every studio, they move site, so they move design site, and the project kind of scales up in ambition and scale. Uh, and with this as well, it's often linked to our field trip, which I'll come back to. So this is really a chance to explore a larger design project. You can see these kind of beautiful master plan designs as well, um, as well as really getting in depth with some of the landscape research and then developing the proposal. So I'm just going to pass over to Tom for um, Design Studio 8, and he's going to talk in a bit more detail about his Design Studio's approach. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, just to kind of further, as Emma was discussing about the different studio's approaches, each studio usually sets a sort of brief for the year, which will kind of determine the way they work and the topics they look at. And in Studio 8, we often believe in a kind of practice-based methodology to the way we do work. We encourage students to kind of get out on site, learn through making, learn through doing, drawing, testing. Here are some photos of us in Flimwell, which is a kind of site down in East Sussex, which we went to a couple of years ago, where we were exploring kind of methods of forestry and how you use this as design tools. And here's some work from Anna, a student from the last year, who was using kind of ways of mapping and understanding trees and forests to engage in her kind of design process. But we sort of foster very much an individual approach to the way we do the work in the studio and encourage students to make, draw and do and kind of be active members in their kind of design work that they're doing. But as said, kind of each studio has a different philosophy in the way they work. This is kind of Studio 8's approach, but you'll find kind of if you're more interested in more of a research approach agenda or you prefer doing kind of certain ways of working, there might be certain studios that are more aligned to those as well. So thank you, Emma. Great, thank you, Tom. So exactly that, and, and you can go onto the website as well and see the different um, studio briefs for this year in a bit more detail, or I think that will be up shortly, hopefully. Um, but you can see the previous year as well to get a bit of a flavor if it's not yet updated. 
So in terms of, of our landscape studio space, um, really exciting this year, we have a new dedicated studio space uh, with additional facilities for landscape architecture students. So this is um, quite near to Euston, it's just further down by King's Cross, and this is a dedicated building for our department. Uh, it's really fantastic. Basically, we have an amazing new suite of kind of uh, design studios where everyone has their own kind of desk space. And then we also have um, a new workshop space. You can see brand new on the left, hasn't yet been used, it's about to be. And then we also have these great kind of collaborative working spaces on the lower ground floor. And we're developing as well our own kind of landscape resources library, uh, as well as the workshop having kind of state of the art, um, various kind of cutting equipment, both kind of digital and also analog techniques. But also we have access to the wider Bartlett resources. So uh, we have an amazing suite of workshops, uh, the Be Made workshops in particular, which are free to use. And there's people that are working on amazing kind of hand, hand crafting, but this also depends um, potentially on things like robotics or much more advanced uh, digital techniques too. So there's a nice balance and people can kind of go down their own route uh, and explore their own methods. There's also um, Flimwell Park, which I think one of the photos was from actually from Tom's. Um, again, this is a really uh, exciting mixed use woodland center, not far from London. And this is really good thing for landscape architecture program to have this resource. And alongside that, we also have various uh, digital um, equipment for site analysis. And um, this can go down to kind of microscopic levels of soil analysis um, to various different uh, kind of quantitative techniques too. So just to introduce history and theory as well. So you can see, uh, this is the lovely Tim on the right here who coordinates the history and theory module. So you'll start the year by having uh, different kinds of lectures as an introduction. And there's various kind of site walking that happens within this process too. This is particularly for MLA year one, when you're being introduced to these different responses um, to kind of critical theory. Uh, as well, students often visit kind of archives and different buildings where this module is delivered in this format. Sorry. So again, um, for the second year as well, it's it's after that the initial introduction, uh, students often develop um, their kind of concepts or passion for the course, and this will start to be more directed. So we also have our seminar topics, and these are some examples that you can um, look at here. In terms of this as well, this is for reading texts or discussing different topics within uh, these particular seminars. And in addition, students get kind of one-to-one -one feedback from a thesis supervisor in your second year as well. So there's lots of different approach and topics that hopefully appeal to different students uh, from ruins or utopian visions uh, for landscapes of different topographical practices and so on. Um, and in terms of the student thesis, you can see some ac extracts rather from the thesis um, from this year and uh, sorry, the year before. And as you can see, two of our excellent students won the Landscape Institute Thesis Award both years. And often students do kind of incorporate aspects of their design projects and kind of use their visual techniques alongside their kind of theoretical passions and their projects. So just to cover in a bit more detail as well, the ecology and uh, technology module. So for the first year, again, this is more of an introduction. Um, you might not necessarily have come from a landscape background, and this will be an introduction into the different kind of aspects of sustainability. And with this, um, this might be looking, for example, at different environmental systems in the first year with the first uh, set of modules. And you might be looking to things, for example, like air, ground, water, landscape and habitation in this module and landscape realization. So building up basically uh, these things, and then hopefully you'll be able to apply it in your design um, process as well. And initially students do kind of review a case study and then build up to design reports. And this goes hand in hand with the design proposal. So then in year two, this is really about specializing and again, about kind of focusing on what you're interested in and getting into a lot more detail through um, this more kind of technical aspect of your work. So again, this module consists of lectures for you to learn about different topics, but there's also lots of different visits. You can see our students out and about in London, looking at various different case studies of landscapes, but also we go and meet various different practitioners and people that are working in maybe landscape maintenance or preservation across the different uh, typologies as well. 
And this is a great experience for people to connect with people and um, various practices and also see what's happening uh, on the ground. More site visits as well, so you can see this is various kind of um, processes in terms of outdoor sketching, as well as seminars that are taken outdoors. And then as well, like for our term two, uh, practice tutors join and help develop the projects as well. And this is really important in terms of bringing their specialist knowledge into the course. And again, we have lots of site visits. So you can see a more recent one from the Thames Barrier visit too. And finally, just to mention, we have a dedicated uh, practice coordinator, which is Kelly Duran, who's there to offer you postgraduate career advice to students. So he's given lots of talks and sessions with students about the different routes to chartership in the UK and the EU. And this might be in terms of you know, publishing, you know, teaching, advocacy, as well as uh, the projects students want to take uh, further in landscape but lots of different sustainable approaches to practice as well and a path into academia too. So again, just to mention alongside your two design tutors, you do have a practice tutor that comes in specifically to support you one-on-one uh, -on -one really in your design project as you're getting into the more technical details of your project. So I'm gonna pass back over to Tom, who's gonna explain, explain in a bit more detail about the skills classes and the workshops he runs. Thanks Emma, yeah. So as described at the beginning, as well as my design teaching, I also coordinate the skills classes and workshops that we have on the course. This year, we've tried to really make sure that they're integrated within the design work you're doing. And here are some images on the previous slide, just with the kind of group project that took place in the year one um, cohort this year, where they were kind of learning model making techniques, digital kind of drawing and modeling techniques. And these sort of all went hand in hand with the larger group projects they were doing. As well as those sessions, we kind of do sessions on kind of landscape model making, visualization, filmmaking, um, and lots of kind of different technical processes that underpin that as well. As well as those, we've kind of wanting to make sure that students all have a pathway through working both digitally and physically in their work and are able to kind of move fluidly between those. So we want to kind of teach different techniques on 2D drawing to 3D modeling, all the way to kind of physical modes of fabrication as well. And to help support this, we're kind of bringing in ex-students and graduates to showcase some of their work, break down some of the methods and modes of production that they used in their own design work. And then also on that, we're kind of also bringing in a lot of experts who are kind of particularly skilled in terms of filmmaking, uh, digital fabrication, digital kind of visualization methods. We've got people who use kind of Unreal Engine in kind of film production as well. So we're trying to kind of have quite a broad outlook within the skills teaching we do, which will underpin all of the design work you're also doing on the course. And that can then result in obviously sort of lovely pieces of work like this model here, which was made by Nima last year, which uses a mixture of kind of physical making to digital kind of forms of paper cutting in order to kind of achieve something like this. Thank you, Ella. Great. Thank you, Tom. So I think my dual screen is slightly playing up. There we go. So, um, and just to mention finally as well, kind of wrapping up these modules, it's really important to say that we're fully accredited from the Landscape Institute. So with both of these programs, um, this will support you in a pathway to um, chartership uh, should you choose to work in the UK. So to talk a bit more about program culture um, before we move towards the admissions details. So we have lots of kind of lovely aspects of our course uh, that develop as well the studio culture and um, your experiences in landscape. So key one here is the field trips. And these are some pictures from recent field trips. So depending on the studio you're in, this will be uh, to a different place. It might be deep in the woodlands. It might be extreme landscapes such as a mountaintop with a DS5 or into various sites that look into material processes. Um, but these are kind of experimental case studies sometimes in other countries too. Alongside that, we also have a lecture series. So various landscape practitioners are also invited to kind of give different talks about their um, own approach to landscape architecture and how they work. And we also have uh, design reviews where students present at different points of the year and they get an opportunity for external and internal feedback. And this is also important in terms of making connections and to people in practice. And then we also have the physical show. Um, so this is the autumn show and hopefully some of you might have seen some of the physical and digital show from the previous year. 
So you can see some pictures. Um, I think this is actually 2022. So in terms of this, it's open to the public at the start of term. This is in September, for example, in 2024. And this showcases all of the landscape, architecture, and current graduating students' work. And we also alongside that have the digital show, um, which we're going to show you in a minute. And this is kind of an archive of digital works, which you can visit and people from all over the world can see this. And it's a bespoke digital exhibition space. And we also have alongside the physical and digital book, which you can see in the corner there. Um, so please do look at these, they're available on issue. And also you can look at the website in more detail in your own time. Alongside this, we also have the Bartlett Instagram. If you don't follow, please do. And uh, this is really where we have you know, student takeovers, for example, they might show you their day or they talk about um, their projects or what they're working on the theory. And we also broadcast public events and talk about studio culture and maybe field work that's going on in the school. It's a really great resource and it's often being updated. So please do look at this as well and, and follow us here. And also just to mention in terms of alumni careers, you can see some of our lovely alumni here. They're working in various different practices. Uh, maybe following uh, the UK route in terms of accreditation, but also looking maybe at kind of further research in academia or with a practice, potentially starting a PhD, or maybe working abroad. There's so many kind of different possibilities that our, that our students go on to. So just to do the admissions overview, finally. So uh, in 2024, I'm just going to talk through some of the guidance. We're open for applications now, and we close on the 5th of April 2024. So just to say, this is kind of the process for admissions. So you start by applying to UCL for either program, the MLA or the MA, and this will be reviewed uh, with you know, your CV, your academic records, um, references, things like this. And then you'll have a design portfolio request from the Bartlett. This will be reviewed by myself and you'll either be selected for an interview, hopefully, or, um, and then you'll have a final decision from us uh, approximately within kind of eight weeks. It may be quicker or slightly longer depending on the time of the year. So you can see some of the entry requirements here. So please check them carefully in terms of English language, the academic requirements and deposit requirements also. And uh, this also clarifies the difference in MA and MLA, which again is maybe a degree in a appropriate subject, but MA we uh, look for applicants that have a degree in landscape architecture and are currently completing um, a professional practice placement. This is all available on the website as well in more detail and you can contact me if you're unsure. So in terms of the design portfolio, we uh, these are the elements we kind of asked for in the design portfolio. So this is kind of currently listed and there'll be kind of more questions about this, I'm sure. Um, but the best thing as well is really to summarize your academic or professional experience and communicate this visually the best you can. So this will be maybe an evidence of a concept development or maybe you're communicating your ideas or your narrative or your skills that are kind of up to, up to date rather. So we're not, we're assuming that, um, you know, if you come from a different background, uh, you might have a very different skill set. And with the MLA, that's kind of expected as well. So we just ask you to bring in as much of your kind of creative process as well to this portfolio. So that's the main thing. But again, we advise really to please try and get your application in as soon as possible uh, for the best chances of this being processed quickly and receiving a response. So I think that's everything. But thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're now going to move to the next portion of the open day, and uh, I think Tom will take over the screen, and then two of our students will talk through their projects in more detail. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Um, so should I start? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll just, yeah, I'll just yeah. If, if useful, I'll just uh, ground it again. <laughs> yeah, so sure. again, just to explain what's, what we're going to do now is uh, moving into the autumn show 2023. I'm going to add it into the chat if it's not already there, so you can uh, look at this too in your own time. But uh, Aditi and uh, Zoya are going to talk through their um, design work and also give a bit more context about the brief uh, for that year. So whenever you're ready, go for it. Thanks, Emma. Um, hello everyone, I am Aditi Nair from Studio 5. I'll just begin with talking about last year's brief and then I will talk to you, uh, talk you through a couple of projects from the studio itself. So last year Studio 5 explored landscape as a continuously unfolding process 
where permanence of environments and their states of equilibrium were challenged. Um, the starting point of last year's studies was the ground plane, which is both an ocean and a physical construct that defined the role of addition and subtraction from an existing mass or body. Um, with this in mind, the term one started along the foreshore of the river Thames, where we kind of surveyed the site using drawings and physical tests that examine the past, present, and future processes of addition and subtraction. And then we kind of developed our observations and research into propositional designs, which were both physically and conceptually uh, born out of reflections on processes of change. Um, then moving on to term two. So in term two, we ventured along the Jurassic coast from stone quarries to ever-changing landscapes shrouded in complex um, conservation, ownership and uh, preservation challenges. We chose our sites during the field trip, which was set against our preliminary research ag agendas. The projects then explored the notion of collection, preservation, museumification, and landscape archival, balanced with the growing need for sustainable systems of landscape use. Now I'll just skim through a couple of projects, starting with the first one, um, so this is a project called the Winspitz Nomadic Nursery by U Yulin that proposes transforming the Winspit quarry into a nursery to redescribe, utilize, and stabilize past quarrying traces, reintroducing native lowland calcareous grasslands in the National Trust land. This nursery provides a mediate across the complex geological transformation and material interaction of post-industrial ruins, converting the migration of stone and seed dispersal to the recolonization of um, habitat. Gulen's process involved studying the local material in detail, um, also studying the habitat cycles and understanding the historical uh, coring processes that will then create a new form of economy. And uh, now moving on to the next one. Uh, this project is by Jo, and her project is called the Bo Boulder's Return Journey, bringing cultural value to abandoned landscapes of Cove Castle. Um, so in her project, she uses Cove Castle's remaining boulders, uh, creating a circular route and five key moments connecting the ancient quarry to the heritage site. The cultural energy is distributed and expanded across the landscape, uh, becoming a sequence of historical symbolisms and eventually balancing the cultural values of places where material were extracted and consumed. Yeah, so these are a couple of her projects, images that you can skim through. And finally, um, my project, it is towards the other end. Yeah, that one, uh, the one next, to, yes. And this is finally my project, which is called Fostering Community Waters, Creating a Common Ground Through Chalk Stream Landscapes. So in term one, I investigated the potential use of chalk as a um, a buffer along the bank side of River Thames, while critically examining the existing buffer on site. Uh, and uh, this kind of led me to dive into the fascinating world of uh, Hampshire's chalk rivers, discovering their rarity and significance. So the river Itchen, which is the chalk river in Winchester, symbolizes the invaluable role that chalk plays in shaping the natural landscapes. However, the importance of the river has resulted in changes in land ownership and access, leading to a growing divide and limiting the benefits to the wider community. Therefore, the project proposes natural and sustainable strategies that mitigate flooding risks in urban areas located further downstream, while creating a common ground for visitors, nurturing a deeper appreciation and understanding of the natural environment. To understand the site and its surroundings, I performed a test um, to determine the extent of flooding on the site, as well as the potential locations of silt deposition 
which further formed the basis for the design proposal. The design incorporates a system that utilizes the natural process of water flow. Um, as the water level rises, the water enters the site and flows through a gravel and chalk bed. And during this journey, the silt present in the water is effectively trapped in designated silt pits. The water then moves through a series of three ponds labeled one, two, and three. And finally, the water exits through the site through a reed bed filter, returning back into the river Itchen. The design effectively uses natural elements and filtration processes to ensure the water's quality before it rejoins the river. And if you just scroll through down, um, these are different frames that are captures, uh, different frames that capture the different seasons and activities um, that happens throughout the year. Um, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. And also to add to that, um, I am a student ambassador. And if you have any questions regarding um, anything like design, I mean, the application process, or if you're getting stuck, I could uh, help you or chat with you on this uh, particular app. I'll just pop in a link in the chat box if any of you is are interested in. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Aditi. That's such a beautiful project. And it's so lovely to see as well the different approaches you all took in studio. And you can kind of all see as well really your, your kind of methods and passions developing um, and taking you in very different directions in that brief. So we're moving on again to Design Studio 8 and we're going to pass over to Zoya, who's going to briefly explain the brief and then talk through some more student projects. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess for Studio 8, I know Tom mentioned a little bit about it, so I won't spend too much time on it. But from a student perspective, um, last year we focused on kind of situating ourselves on the edge and what that means. Um, it kind of questions a lot of times when we think about boundaries and like edge conditions of different landscapes. And a lot of the projects really investigate that thoroughly. Um, also, Studio 8, we do a lot of um, research-based design and iterative design, which helps us kind of um, build like a really holistic narrative in all of our projects. I think that it's really fun to kind of be asked and challenged to do different things almost every week. And I think that, you know, you learn so much about things that you would have never expected, um, different methods of mapping, different methods of representation. And it's not only focused on, you know, a beautiful final drawing, but it really is about the process, which I like really appreciate from the design studio. Um, and I'm briefly gonna talk about two previous students' work and then my own work. So we'll start maybe with Anna's work. Um, yeah, so Anna's work, basically, this is her year two project and it looks at water as the primary subject. She situated herself in Monterrey, Mexico, which is close to her hometown, it's her home country. And her project is basically this master plan of uh, reinvigorating and this, kind of like barren landscape. And what I really enjoyed and learned a lot from her project was how to involve community, what forms of representation, and also just like the idea of water as a main character in her project. She designed with these two pools, um, these ridges in mind, um, and her whole project basically looked at reinvigorating a quote unquote barren landscape and how to invite water back into the land. Um, and she also worked in a bunch of different methodologies. She has amazing final drawings, but then also this um, model and where she used like actual material similar to the one on site carved into it. So her methodology was also very interesting and very fascinating. Um, and I guess we can also mention her term one project, which was, we were all situated in Leon Sea, which is among the, cha cha uh, the Thames estuary. 
And so she did this really interesting drawing of basically documenting her time on site for, I think it was eight, eight hours. Um, and she used like a photo obscura to take a picture and document that, um, which I, I really like that. And so, yeah, it was a really beautiful way of representing landscape and it kind of just shows you what different things you can do um, in your projects. You're kind of not limited to any one thing. And then we can go to Nima's project. Um, so Nima's project uh, for her second term was on the herring girls and it kind of looked at like a critical heritage master plan. Um, so she situated herself in Wick, which is a town in the Scottish Highlands. And her project basically looks at this lost narrative of the herring girls, which were these group of women who would travel down um, the coast of the United Kingdom, uh, catching herring fish and how kind of like their, how they kind of shaped the landscape in each of the towns they moved down in and how these women would kind of follow the natural cycles of these fish. And a lot of what Nima was doing was like knowledge production in restoring the heritage of these, of these women and like telling their stories. So her approach is a much more, is grounded in a lot more like political theory and heritage landscapes and how to do heritage landscapes beyond just like a little blue pack saying that this is where these women were and how to kind of restore their story and their narrative in shaping a lot of these coastal towns in a way that is meaningful. So she came up with um, different spatial programming and also like, uh, and developing the master plan for her um, methodologies. Uh, she used a bunch of different ways of unpacking and like rediscovering knowledge and utilizing different ways of kind of researching this heritage. Um, and it resulted in like these beautiful drawings as well as this like really detailed model that kind of showcases her methodology and a lot of the work and nothing is like, in chronological order, it kind of all informs each other, um, which is like a really interesting and unique way of working. Um, and I think it was super successful in this project. And then I can talk about my little project <laughs> from last term. Uh, should be here somewhere. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so my project uh, was based in Camberwell, Suffolk, and I decided to base my second term project in London because I wanted to be really situated in my site. And so having something that you can visit is like a really interesting way to like keep on feeding back your design from site. And this is something that like I really benefited from because of this choice. Um, so basically I looked at, a uh, abandoned or yeah, an abandoned police station that is out of commission in Camberwell and kind of investigated the possibilities of how to use this police station as, um, and how can it be reused for public use? Um, looking at different methodologies and kind of ways of working. I use like different ways of site analysis, um, kind of like talking to the people on site. And one benefit of having the site in London is that you can go and visit quite often. So looking at things like paving, looking at things like planting plants and just like furniture, like I think I utilize a lot of traditional landscape um, ways of making space and making a space that's comfortable for people, no matter who you are, no matter what time. I think it really helped me establish like that method of working. And I didn't have a background in landscape architecture. So I think that it's really nice to have a project that makes you do this um, so that like you're able to have that language and use that. And then I made master plan as well as using animation as like my final form of representation um yeah again different methodologies always like come in and um are overlaid on top of each other uh nothing is done in like a super straight fashion like everything is kind of feeds into each other at some point and then it comes together at the end 
Uh, at least that's how I work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Amazing. Thanks so much, Sawyer. It's um, such a beautiful piece of work as well. And really lovely to see how you will explore different elements of kind of narrative um, in terms of the her heritage and also with these different agents and kind of following them in the landscape and seeing these different perspective shifts as well. It's really beautiful. So I think that's um, at the end of this part of the open day. And what we're moving to now is the Q&A session. So please do keep um, dropping questions in the chat. Uh, this can be, um, for example, about the kind of culture of the school or questions about the design studio or these guys' kind of backgrounds, how they came to study landscape architecture, uh, or it can be about emissions as well. So please do keep adding this too. So there was a first question which I spotted, which was from Jake, um, which was, do the studios attend other studios' design reviews or are they separate? Uh, so yeah, good question. So we do have um, quite often kind of cross reviews where different studios um, will kind of pair up and you'll be able to uh, see what everyone's been doing in the kind of departments and see everyone's different approaches. But I might just pass this over to, um, to Zoya and Aditi to kind of say your experience as well of seeing how everyone works in very different ways in, in the Bartlett. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that it's it really depends on um, a bunch of things. Like, I think I really enjoy doing, like, cross reviews. Um, and I think we do a lot with Studio 5, so that's also really nice to kind of get, like, the feedback from other students. I think you benefit a lot from uh, doing these, like, cross reviews. And usually they're, like, very low pressure, kind of just, like, getting feedback from people who are not in your studio, so maybe not so familiar with your project. Um, it's really helpful for also not just like your design, but also just presentation and communication skills as well, because like none of these people have read about your project, even the tutors haven't. So it's really informative to get that feedback. Um, I think also a lot of times, even when a studio is having a review, and it's not like directly with your studio. I mean, it's usually open invite, like you can sit in and like still learn about what people are doing. And I would do that quite a bit last year, just like if studio two is having a review, you can just kind of pop into the room and like sit and learn still. Just to add to that, um, yeah. And also all these crits and reviews kind of help um, yourself. Uh, to kind of look at your project from a whole perspective from start to end and kind of get feedback from your peers and also feedback from different tutors and yeah it's a nice way to kind of look at your project as a whole uh, before the final submission. Great, thank you both. Yeah, I think this really is the benefit of having these lovely open plan studios we currently have as well, where you can really see what everyone's been up to. And again, it's not like it's closed off in a corner. It's very fluid in that way. Um, there's a couple more questions appearing in the chat, which is great. I'm just having a look through. So there's two questions that are quite similar, so I'm gonna come back to that. But there's a couple of technical questions or more technical questions that I can just answer more quickly. Um, so there was a question about the usual kind of teacher student ratio in design studio projects. Um, at the moment, this, this does change, but at the moment, for example, our design studios have uh, 15 students and kind of two tutors that lead them. And it, this is always kind of the format to have two design tutors. They bring their own unique collaboration and their own perspectives on the design brief as well. And it's a really important part of our design culture at the Bartlett. Um, regarding, there's a question about portfolio, which I can answer quickly. So um, in terms of this as well, when you uh, are invited to um, upload your portfolio or create your portfolio link, you will be directed to the portfolio um, requirements, which have more information as well. And those are on the website too. So that has more details about, for example, page formats and things like that. So I won't go into too much detail, but in this case, for example, it's 20 pages and that the more standard format might be, for example, um, A4, A3, just to remind people that is um, reviewed on a screen as well. So just to be mindful of that. And 
Oh, there's more. <laughs> I'm going to, while I take a look at the more technical questions and see if I can summarize, I'm going to bounce to one that's come up um, from Anna, which said that she would like to hear more about the various uh, education backgrounds for the MLA. Uh, for example, she's an art historian. Um, and Zoya and Aditya, you mentioned that you're from different backgrounds. Could you kind of explain a little bit what your entry route was into landscape architecture and, and why you chose the Bartlett? Yeah. Um, so I did my education from India. Um, I am an architect by profession. And so in India, typically you have a five-year course in architecture. And after completing my course, I kind of did like a two-year, uh, I have two-year work experience where I worked in India itself. I worked in a range of um, different projects uh, from commercial to kind of residential projects and I've also dealt into like a community engagement kind of different projects in CSR as well. And during that exposure, I kind of um, got introduced to landscape. And this is when I found myself being more um, inclined towards uh, landscape and which is why I applied to the Bartlett. And yeah, I'm studying landscape now, quite enjoying the course yeah but again uh, there are uh, people from different uh, courses as well like uh, there are people from anthropology um, geography and so I think all of your backgrounds really help enhance your experience within the landscape uh, course and some bits and pieces will kind of lead you to or help you to uh, formulate your project or uh, kind of lead you in a certain way of how you want to represent your project yeah great thank you it's yeah exactly as you say there's so many different routes in to the MLA course particularly and that that is the two-year um, conversion course as well so that really can be from diverse backgrounds as you mentioned and again so that's uh, like you said anthropology geography and if you're preparing kind of a design portfolio you know do include um, parts of your academic work as well there's so many skills in geography and anthropology that do cross over in terms of research in terms of uh, concept and, and how you frame projects and, and analyze them and then as well you know bringing in your own creative processes and uh, we've seen you know many of our students bring in you know personal um, uh, skills as well in terms of you know hobbies and uh, you know knitting always jumps to mind but <laughs> you know in that way you know trying to demonstrate as well that you spatialize through your techniques too so if that's through hand drawing you know different ways to create space too. So just jumping back to some more technical ones, I'll do those quickly. Um, right, where am I? So somebody mentioned about um, if they have group work in their um, kind of background in terms of their previous degree. So if you've been doing a lot of group work, absolutely, you can include that in your design portfolio, but it's important to really label that and make it very clear where the group work is. Um, but we do ask you to try and include your individual work uh, beforehand. So even if that's more kind of creative projects as well, but try to really lead with academic projects that you've um, worked on solo before you then include, include the group work as well. There was one more that I can answer as well. It, in terms of the technical process. And so that's about English level two, um, which is now a, a requirement for um, MLA um, and MA programs. And you can read more about that online. I'm going to drop in in a minute uh, a link to the um, English details in terms of language requirements for UCL. And you can read through that in a bit more detail. Um, but students do basically take the relevant English um, What's the word I'm looking for? Not courses, but you'll see from the website what the kind of uh, selected ones are that you can take before you start the course. So just to open back up to, hmm. So that's my email. <laughs> um, so I'm just coming down to way. So they're asking, is it common for people to work um, on places within the UK or also uh, different sites? Is there any difficulty researching different sites? So again, I might pass that back over to you too. What's your experience been kind of working on sites or des on design sites that is in the UK and abroad as well? Um, so 
so for our studio what we had done is so during the field trip so last year we went on a road trip and along the road trip we kind of selected different sites and um, so while doing like a particular research of that particular site i think we went back to the site once or twice to just understand or to get a feel about it but other than that we tried to get as much as possible a lot of information uh, from the times we went to the site the times one or two times because uh, that's the only time you can get a lot of research other than that um, there's no much time so and I think we did a lot of internet research as well a lot of books uh, researching from the books and yeah uh, that's about it Great, thank you. I'm just, um, there's quite a few questions coming in. I'm a bit conscious of the time. Um, would you guys be able to stay for another five minutes or so? I'm just thinking as we started a little bit late, is that okay? Okay, great. I'm seeing nodding, so I'm <laughs> assuming we're all right if we don't get chucked out of the Zoom meeting. Um, but maybe, yes, and thank you. Um, Penny's just clarified the English language requirements much more eloquently than I did. Um, so you can check that as well in the chat. But I, as she's clarified, no, it's not a requirement when you apply. It's something that would be included in the offer. So that's important to note as well. Um, can they provide a portfolio? Hmm. I'm going to jump, I think, to a question that I saw in the middle that was about um, different collaborations between programs. So in terms of kind of inter-studio exchange, as they phrased it, um, because we're a chartered course, we really do stay within, uh, you know, the landscape architecture modules and programs in that way. But there are lots of different collaborations across the school in terms of more like um, open uh, lectures and workshops. Um, I'm wondering, Tom, would it be right if I bounce to you to maybe talk about your experience with this? Because there's lots of kind of open lectures where people can experience this. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think um, something along that lines, which is kind of important to note, is that a lot of the people who teach on the landscape course also teach in other aspects of the university as well. So um, Richard Beckett, who teaches in Studio 3, also teaches on the kind of Bio ID course. Uh, Lawrence, who teaches Studio 5, teaches on the BSc architecture course. I've taught on a few different courses across the school. So there's already within the kind of um, department itself, there's a lot of integration between the landscape and then the other kind of courses that are happening in wider UCL. And through my own teaching, I've often tried to get kind of students from one course to come in and talk to the other and vice versa. I think what we've done in our studio is even kind of outside of UCL, but in the kind of wider London universities, we've tried to do exchanges with Westminster University, which is situated down the road as well, where we'll kind of go there, present some of the student work and have a sort of dialogue between some of the design studios at that school. And are there any kind of like relationships or um, connections we can foster between those places? So it's usually done on a kind of studio by studio basis most of the time. And depending on the kind of direction of the design studio and the contacts they have, they quite often quite like to kind of open out the conversation to other members of the wider UCL kind of family and also the kind of wider academic community in the UK and London as well. So yeah, it's something that's quite often considered. And I think landscape as a course in general often tries to kind of tackle a lot of things that aren't just about designing something in a site, but could be due to ecology, biology, planning. Um, there's lots of different aspects that go into that. So it's really important to always be making those connections and kind of opening up that conversation. Great, thank you, Tom. Yeah, it's such a, a key point about the fact that um, many of uh, people that teach on the course are interdisciplinary in terms of their approach and, and their interests. So really you have such a broad range of interests coming together on the course as well. And that's kind of what pulls apart the design studios in terms of people's passions and their methods. And uh, that allows students to be able to kind of test different um, approaches each year and explore different methods within that as well. So um, there's a question here about I think this relates to their academic work and they ask um, if, for example, maybe from their background, they've done more, I think, analytical work like maps and GIS tools instead of maybe more creative um, exploration. And what would they recommend or what we recommend in terms of individually working on a project? 
Um, we, I would say just before I um, pass over to the others is that it's important to still include that academic work as well to show kind of your research analysis. And that is mentioned as well in the portfolio requirements, but absolutely you can bring in kind of individual and personal work. And sometimes in my opinion, that can be coming back to basics in terms of, you know, analog skills, in terms of sketching, you know, painting, even you're really finding ways to spatialize something um, via kind of hand skills can be such a great way in even if you um, maybe have just taken an introductory course to something or you're, you're looking online and kind of getting passionate about different methods and techniques. Um, so maybe I think Zoya, because you mentioned you had a slightly different background as well from landscape architecture, if you could talk about your process about kind of finding or getting uh, excited in, about the kind of creative process. Yeah, sure. So I actually come from like a ecology and sociology background. So I did not have many design projects like integrated in any of my academic journey until my master's. Um, so for the portfolio, I remember having very similar questions of like, oh my gosh, what do I put in? I've only done academic papers. Um, so a lot of the things that I put in were like kind of my personal um explorations in different like techniques of art and design and things like that like I would put in like my watercolors I did like some etchings things like that anything kind of creative will be helpful and I think that the portfolio is not only like it doesn't have to just be like plans and sections and things like that I think it's also important to show like original thinking problem solving like there are different things that you can showcase in your portfolio um, and it doesn't only have to be your academic work, at least like that's what I included in my portfolio. I because I didn't have much academic architectural or landscapey work. It was mostly just like more STEM based research and things like that. So I think that if you have done things that are outside academics, it's still important to put that in and like not like grand maybe not just like random paintings, but like if you've worked on like projects and like collaborated with other artists or things like that, like that would be really helpful to include. Um, I definitely included some of my GIS maps and things like that in my portfolio, but like also feel free to use this time be before applying to like, if you want to explore something or like have a specific drawing in mind, then you can work on it and add it to your portfolio. I think that individual projects are also really important, but yeah, the portfolio is kind of to show creativity, like problem solving. Um, yeah, that's just how I approached it with like not that much design background in my academics. Thank you, Zoya, that's really, really helpful. I think that's probably answered kind of a couple of people's questions of like, how do you bring in that aspect of kind of uh, concept design? Maybe when you're coming from, like you said, a, a more analytical background in that way, um, which again is, is, is very common. And it is, as you said, showing that creative process, showing problem solving as well, and being able to um, think through these processes in terms of a design spatializing. And yeah, that can be, you know, so many things. It doesn't have to be drawing, it can be modeling and, yeah, all sorts of things. I think we're going to have to um, wrap it up here as we're already at five past. Um, but just thank you so much everyone for joining us today.